You may think after Kratos is crowned the new God of Hope that the new God of War Ragnarok Valhalla DLC is over. It turns out there's a lot more that you can discover. There is a secret ending where all of the lore is exhausted and a big change happens for Mimir and Sigrun and the realms. You have to beat the game at least up to Niflheim, Mustafel, and Helheim upwards of 20 times to get all the dialogue that you need to achieve this true ending. It is a long one, and it references the point where Sigrun saves both Kratos and Mimir, and then goes on from there. Hope you enjoy. Do you yet wish to speak about Sigrun? She was eager to receive you mere days ago. What has changed? Oh, don't pretend to be interested in my romantic life, brother. I am interested, and you are evading the question. What happened? Well, after you dropped me off at a longhouse the other night, Sigrun made a cloudberry and hazelnut pudding. Of course, I don't eat anymore, so slightly awkward, but a lovely thought. And? Pretty much it, really. Hmm. There is more to this. What else happened that night between you and Sigrun? We stayed up much too late. I told her stories, she told me secrets. She put spirits to my lips, even though I can't get drunk. Then she invited me to watch her fall asleep. Hmm. And the next morning? The next morning we took a boat along the Lake of Nine. It was divine, brother. The lake was sun-dappled, crisp and perfect. You could smell the thaw. When did you misspeak? You know me too well, brother. We were on the lake when I put my metaphorical foot in it. Hmm. Well, tell me, what happened between you and Sigrun on the lake? Well, she was rowing past where you found her family treasury. Where we learned she cursed her brother over forbidden love. That's right. And as we rowed by, I remember feeling grateful that the place was now deep underwater where she couldn't see it. And at that moment, she turned to me. And she said, I think, Mimir, I might be smitten with you. I think maybe I want to kiss you. Hmm. Mm, indeed, brother. I mean, there's always been more to us than there's been the opportunity to explore. So much unspoken beneath the surface. But hard to name it so boldly, uh, it took me a bit off guard. You and Sigrun, I am still waiting for the part where you spoke. In my defense, I only told her the truth as it struck me in the moment. I told her my feelings for her were deep as Rand's Hall and had been for as long as I'd known her. But just then a kind of revelation came over me. A sudden cold clarity that it was vanity to imagine that I, as I am, could be enough for her as she is. So I heard myself tell her that I didn't think I could give her what she needed. Now. I am mad at you. Pile on, brother. I deserve it. So, you told Sigrun you could not give her what she needed. You spoke out of cowardice. Aye, obviously. But as prospects for terror go, can you imagine knowing all along you're not enough for someone? And then living out their slow realization of that truth? I admit it chilled me to the bone. You presume to know how she will feel in the future. Why discredit her wishes and yours in the present? I just can't pretend not to know better. She's romanticized the idea of us. Certainly I've done the same. But is that anything to build a future on? I mean, look at me, brother. Be practical. Hmm. If anyone else disparaged you as you disparaged yourself, I would wish to strike them with an axe. Now, back to Sigrun and your low opinion of yourself. Look, brother, I don't apologize for wanting her to have someone who can be everything to her. She deserves the best. Then why should she not deserve the smartest man alive? Sometimes I think you've come too far, brother. Did I overstep? No, no, Kratos. I appreciate your point. 
And to be fair, if I was so right, then why am I so angry at myself? I must admit, Sigrun, Valhalla isn't exactly what I imagined. You're experiencing only a very small part of it. One that's independent and unconnected from the rest of Valhalla. Elsewhere, there are larger neighborhoods where the dead reside. Socializing, playing games, drinking, fighting. But one must earn the right to join their fallen comrades. New arrivals run a gauntlet. A personalized, self-contained version of what you're doing. It's meant to help the dead process the lives they lived. Those who are worthy, who have found some measure of closure, are allowed to move forward. Those who are unable to resolve their lives are forever trapped in their personal Valhalla. Some just prefer to keep fighting here. Oh, I still can't bear the thought of Seekrin having damaged herself to save us. Or having damaged her connection to Valhalla, which she doubtless say was worse. Will there be consequences beyond her injuries? I don't suppose I can be sure of that either way. But I'm certainly going to begin worrying about it now. Thank you kindly. Did Valhalla return you to your forest last time? Aye, brother. And this time I wasn't alone. Were you attacked? No, far from it. Apparently my Valhalla isn't the stuff of constant combat at all. The memories of mine it draws on are more interpersonal. To wit, I found myself reliving old times with my former crew of fairy folk. Cobweb, mustard seed, the whole pack in there do wells. Such warm greetings for their old ringleader, like nearly a day had passed. Sounds... pleasant. Rather was, to be honest. I remain suspicious, but if this process is doing something for you, I remain open to seeing what it has in mind for me. The more that Valhalla makes me revisit my misadventures with Oberon, the more like a dream it all seems. Which is ironic. Back then in my youth, I could hardly bear to sleep. Then, with time, I came to value a proper night's rest. In captivity, it was nearly the only escape I knew. And then the need to sleep went away completely. And I don't miss the time lost, but damn it, brother. I do miss dreaming. The mind comes to terms with itself in ways only possible with your waking judgment out of the way. Our hidden desires, our anxieties, like a bifrost window to what's going on in your soul. And Valhalla does the same. Aye. And I don't think I realized how much I needed it. Before you ask, yes, I was back in my old forest again. And this time I encountered my former boss, King Oberon. Rather eye-opening, actually. I used to be a true believer for him. Would have done anything he asked. But now I see through all that charisma and feigned wisdom down to the small hypocritical tyrant I know him to be. Wait till I tell you what he put me up to regarding a particular magical flower. You wish to tell a story of your first master? Aye. Seems to be the very story Valhalla has me reliving, in fact. Oberon fancied himself romantic, you see. Always claimed that love was more important to him than anything. One time, he led his entire entourage on a journey to attend the wedding of some duke or other near your old neck of the woods. The groom, this lordly prick, had conquered a warrior queen and was marrying her as part of terms for peace. And this somehow was so romantic to Oberon that he dragged us across the sea to pay respects. Never mind, he was quarreling with his own queen the entire way. Well, I'll have more of that one to be sure. As I was saying about my old master and his lofty, so-called romantic ideals, we'd settled in a forest outside of Athens, a place well situated to observing the comings and goings of the Duke's other guests. There we observe the romantic complications of some local use, and Oberon gets it into his head to intervene, bids me fetch him a magical flower that can manipulate the affections of others. Supposedly, the idea was to nobly help true love prevail over the pressure of family arrangements. But what he really wanted was to use the flower to torment his own wife. 
I see why you left his service. I. Brother, while I'd love to say I left Oberon's service as a matter of principle, the truth is it was much more a question of pride. If he'd simply shown me more appreciation, who knows how long I might have tolerated his evils. I certainly tolerated plenty from my subsequent employers before I could take no more. If I'm being honest, I was only too happy to offer my complicity in Queen Titania's humiliation. What did you do? I caused her to fall in love with something preposterous. An actor. Your old master. He had you make his wife fall in love with another. Aye, temporarily, by use of this magic flower. Though now it's clear to me the flower's effect isn't love exactly, but a kind of obsessive devotion that is too often mistaken for love. So of course the queen made a fool of herself. As did all those under the flower's spell that night. Don't know how I ever got embroiled in such a farce. You are wiser now. I think so. Though that only makes up for so much past stupidity. Seagrin, I wanted to tell you. Valhalla keeps sweeping me away to my own adventure in memory. I wondered if it would. That's wonderful. What is it showing you? some particular events of my wayward youth. But they're in a loop of sorts. Not sure I've quite gleaned what it all amounts to. Then you must do what you do in Valhalla. Keep going. Sigrun has been important to you for as long as I have known you. What happened in the beginning? Oh, it's a typical enough story. A boy meets girl, girl fulfills her ambition to transcend the physical plane and become a Valkyrie of Valhalla. One day, Sigrun quietly arrived from Fjordalund and began serving as Freya's handmaiden while she undertook training for the Sisterhood. I don't even think we were introduced. I just see her around the court. Of course, I'd observed her loveliness and impressive stature but long before we fell to talking. But we seem cut from different cloth, I suppose. Never occurred to me we'd get along as well as we did. You and Sigrun, how was it you first spoke? Back when Freya was queen in Asgard, the better times, I mean, there really began to be some culture around the place. Poets, musicians, the odd contortionist would pay visits, perform, mingle. On one occasion, I'd taken a seat expecting to see this balladeer of the lowlands when Sigrun walked in. Somehow more stunning than I'd ever seen her. And when of all places she chose to sit next to me, well, a lot of very interesting things happened very quickly. But I may need to collect my thoughts while you get us killed again. Let us get back to your memories of Sigrun. She sat beside you. Yes, she chose to sit next to me. No big thing, really. Yet, somehow, despite myself, I felt a rush in my stomach like I was a green lad again. Embarrassing at the end of the day, to be so simple. I made some remark, and I learned how it felt to make her laugh. And suddenly I felt more at ease. Almost eerily so. A calm within each other's storms, I suppose. They had a way of describing that. Peace dwells among us. Lovely, brother. That's exactly right. Mamir, you may speak more of coming to know Sigrun. Right. Where were we? After the ice was broken, we fell to talking more regularly, even making a point to do so. It was all I could do to enjoy our company responsibly, staying mindful of our respective positions and keep from crossing any line that would make things difficult for us to recover from. Hmm. Wise. Well, mostly. I'm always wisest in the parts I let myself remember. Romir, what happened next with Sigrun? She had introduced me as a good friend. And though I couldn't be entirely sure what she meant by it, for once I wasn't concerned with an outcome. Regarding Sigrun, I knew my answer was yes. The question itself seemed secondary. 
You were not upset she called you friend. Show me someone for whom friendship means lack of love, and I'll show you someone who wonders why their lovers never end up being worth the time. Perhaps. But you did not express your feelings. Oh. I don't think she could have escaped noticing them. I just never asked her anything I felt sure she'd have to refuse. Your relationship with Sigmund. Why so reluctant to tell her how you felt? She was on the Valkyrie's path, preparing to transcend her corporeal form. That was her focus, her chosen purpose, and I didn't want to suggest myself as an obstacle. I suppose I let some part of myself imagine she might recognize my affection, even reciprocate it. But now that we know what she was running from, obviously she'd never again risk choosing love over duty. A unique heartfelt friendship, that is what could endure, and that is what I chose to embrace. Mimir, can you hear me? Has my voice broken through? Sigrun? Yes! Hello! How are you talking to... How long have you been able I to hear? I haven't been listening to you. There's just something I needed to tell you. Valhalla is displeased with me. It wishes a penance of sorts. Trials to reforge my loyalty. I haven't decided what to do, but... I hoped we could talk about it. Aye. Let's do. Next time we die, or Kratos gets a headache. Secret. What's this about Valhalla questioning your loyalty? I thought everything was all right. It is. For you are alive. And I am no longer in pain. But my transgression was not without consequences. Valhalla has... penalized me. I could not enter now if I wanted to. In fact, I am not sure if it will welcome me in death. What? That can't be right. No one's more worthy of Valhalla than you. You can't have sacrificed that for my sake. It's not fair. There's no blame to place here. When you do what you know is right in your heart, the results are not always what you hope for. That doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. Now please, we've kept Kratos long enough from his journey. I insist. Go. We'll talk more. Mimir, I've been thinking a lot about the costs and risks of what Valhalla would put me through to affirm my loyalty. It's enough to make me question not my love of this place, but is it really what's most important to me? If I can't answer that, then perhaps I am not ready for such a decision. Then you should take all the time you need. Absolutely. If Valhalla isn't what you truly need, then you have a rare opportunity to reassess your priorities. I'm glad you agree. Mamir, I had a thought. What you said to me, that you didn't think you could give me what I needed. I... I've been trying to figure out why you'd say such a thing. I know you don't say things without a reason, even if you don't know what it is at first. But I think I figured it out. It's not that there is anything lacking in you. It's that in the end, nobody can give me everything I need to be happy. Not even Valhalla. That's something I have to give myself. And to do that... You need to find yourself. That's true. And we're saying that's what I meant all along? Forever, eh? I'm sure you can see by now. Valhalla has a way of making you learn what you need to learn. Perhaps it does so with me. Even now. Making such demands so as to give me doubts. Long ago, I gave myself completely to love. And it destroyed my home and family. Then I threw myself into the service of Valhalla and found a new family in my sisters. 
But what if that's not where my story ends? It's time I finally found my path. Not because it may or may not be Valhalla's will, or Freya's, or yours, my dear, but my own. Well said, love. I've come to a decision. At least for the time being, I'm going to step back from the price Valhalla has asked of me. Good for you, Seagram. I think maybe it's time I traveled. Experienced these realms and the lands beyond. Not as Valhalla's emissary, but as a person. That's perfect. You've always dreamed of a grand sea voyage, seeing the world. Perhaps I could go with you. I've been told I'm a useful guide. Perhaps. But let's not distract Kratos further. I'm having a bit of a sinking feeling that Seagram doesn't want me traveling with her. You knew that before you asked. Did I, brother? You know the journey she seeks. It is the one you took, and I took. The kind that brings you to the tests you need. The kind you take alone. It's true. I gave in to her weakness. Even now, there's some part of me that just wants to tell her how much I love her and beg her to stay. But that's bloody selfish. I need to do better than that. Mimir. Seagren? Uh, about my journey. I need to take some time to understand who I am without wings and helms and missions and without the lovely man with whom the timing has yet to work out. Are you sure we couldn't discuss this face to face? I wasn't sure I could say the words if I had to look at your face. Just promise you'll let me see you off. I won't have you set in sail without my blessing. And not that you need it. Of course. Have you a blessing to offer her? I'll be combing Valhalla for one. Still no Seagram. You don't suppose she's avoiding me? No. Brother, the last time Valhalla spirited me away to the forest, there was an interesting twist. As the revels ended, I found myself alone, still carrying the magic love flower, and I came upon a sleeping person. But it wasn't the Queen, or the Foolish Youths. It was Seagrin, as I knew her before. I found myself faced with the proposition that with a few drops, I could make her care about nothing in the world so much as me. What did you do? I'm pleased to report that I crushed that flower with my bare hands. I am glad to hear it. Seagrin, listen. You have choices ahead of you that none but you can make. I'll always be there for you when you need me. And if what you ever need is for me to let you go, then, damn it, I'd find a way. But whatever comes, I just want you to put yourself first for once. You're so much more than any office, any title, any function. And I can't wait to see who else you may become. I'm so relieved you understand. Now that Kratos has found answers to his questions, I believe my service here is done. Arrangements are being made. Please, continue to seek what more you would seek within. I promise, I won't just disappear. How are you faring, Amir? I know Seagrin's decision must be given. May I ask, deep down, what is it she means to you? So much of everything good in what I am is only due to my wanting to be the person she saw me as. Take her out of the equation, and I wonder if I'd ever have stopped being a scoundrel in service of scoundrels. Love can make us wish to improve. I was changed by what Faye saw in me. But losing her 
did not put an end to who I had become. Her inspiration remains. Aye. I suppose being the person they turned us into is a way to keep them with us. Honor the impact they had on us. Mimir, what you said about love turning you into a better person. I wonder, what if that better person was within you all along? You could only see it once it was reflected in another. As though love is the feeling of recognizing the potential in our own soul. You mean to say falling in love is really only about ourselves? Not only that, one hopes, but the more we can own the part that is about ourselves, the more we can see others for who they really are, and love them, truly, in whatever form that takes. The mirror. Kratos. My time to depart draws near. The ways of Valhalla are familiar to you both now. You may continue and return as you desire. I'll wait for you on the beach. We'll be there, Sigrun. Are you all right? Aye, brother. I feel a pain in an organ I no longer possess, but the sooner she sets off, the sooner she may return. Thank you, my queen. My sister, Sigrun. Whether Valkyrie, Shield Maiden, or whatever else you should call yourself in time, I shall always be your sister. Do you hear me? I hear you. So this is it then? For now. For however long. Good. I mean, I'll miss you more than I can say, but whatever we ever were, or, or weren't, or might have been if the timing weren't just so... I need you to know that it mattered. All of it. Knowing you helped make me a person I can stand to be. And all I want for you in exchange is... everything. I can't imagine a world in which I don't end up very close with you, my love. But let me come back to you whole. Let me come back not needing anyone to tell me what I need to be happy. I can't begrudge you getting to know yourself. After all, it's been one of the great pleasures of my life. Farewell, Sigrun, and good luck. Thank you, Kratos. Farewell, my friends. Fair winds, my love. Shall we occupy our minds? Aye. Not sure I'll feel like talking much more today, but let's focus on the work. <laughs> 